Our message is titled, Wounded for Me. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for Jesus. That he was wounded for us, that he died on the cross of Calvary, that we might be saved from our sins, and that we might have him in our heart and look forward to his soon coming and the place he's prepared for us in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Missouri author Jim C. Heffley wrote over 50 books, including Way Back in the Ozarks, Way Back in the Hills, and Way Back When in his, you guessed it, Way Back series. Jim passed away in 2004 in Hannibal, Missouri. Now I share about Jim because uh, he had a fascinating quote on the impact of Christ that I wanted to begin today's message with, and I thought, how cool is that? The author was from here in Missouri. He said, here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, and then for three years, he was an itinerant, meaning traveling preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. And all the armies that ever marched, and all the navies that were ever built, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. James C. Heffley, Hannibal, Missouri. Think about that. In fact, the calendar is set to coincide with the birth of Christ. We look at, even today, as people are talking about equality and social justice things, those things really all go back, at least in a principle of, Jesus treated everyone equitably and fairly. And uh, that was the ministry, the kindness, the heart of Jesus. We find that society is permeated with principles from Christ today, even in a secular setting. Even those that don't believe in Christ, even those that don't accept Christ, in spite of themselves, have been more greatly influenced by His life, teachings, and ministry than they even know. That's right, amen. Now, as we look into our passage today, it's Isaiah 53, by the way. Turn there with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. It can truly be said no one person ever impacted the world to the degree at which Christ has. And this is brought out in our passage today. And we'll be looking at an overview here in Isaiah chapter 53 of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This week as I was studying on You know, it's so much to talk about. We could spend a whole sermon series just on Christ's life or on his death or on his resurrection. But as we look at this belief that we're talking about, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, I was hoping, is there one passage we could find that would talk about this? And then I began to think, you know, if if we were in the first century A.D. and the New Testament had not been put together yet, how would we go about uh, finding a passage to talk about this? We would only have the Old Testament. Do you realize that all the New Testament, early New Testament preachers preached the gospel from the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been compiled yet? That's right. You know, uh, Paul wrote uh, roughly half the New Testament or more. Think about that. What was he preaching from? He was preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Is Jesus there? Yes, he is. And so look here in Isaiah chapter 53, and let's see it come to life. And as we do today here in Isaiah... There it is, Isaiah chapter 53. Today as we explore this passage, we're going to use a popular song off of Christian radio today as an overlay. It actually overlays nicely with this text. I didn't realize it until uh, just uh, last night, but it really does. Uh, You see, what I often do is when I'm preaching on a topic, I will try to find me a song for the week. And then I drive my family and everyone nuts singing it all the time. You know, just to kind of help me as my thoughts and prayers and everything. And so it was going all right this week. In fact, I even thought about singing it for you at the end today since it would be time for you to leave anyway. But my wife didn't feel it was even quite that good yet. And so anyway, uh, I will spare you from that um, tragedy uh, this morning. 
But we will use the song, and we'll have some fun with it. It's amazing how it overlays. Now, you're going to fare better than my neighbors did. My allergies have been horrible, but my neighbors had a load of rock, big rock, not, not big rock, a big pile of little rocks delivered to go in their driveway this week. They'd had some trouble during the snow, and they asked if I'd come over with my tractor with the bucket and spread it. And even though my allergies have been crazy, I, I of course, said, yes, I'll be glad to. And so I went over and did that uh, Thursday, and, and uh, poor folks, they even went inside and I'm sure they could still hear me bellowing this song off the tractor but you know that's the price they had to pay to get the gravel spread and so you know things cost money and even when it's free and so and it costs something they had to listen they got uh, they got the song and so uh, you'll get a better version of it at the end I'm going to play it for you from the actual uh, from the actual um, artist at the end after we go off of live stream because it's copyrighted and we can't broadcast it so, uh, living he loved me, dying he saved me, and buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Yeah, and Isaiah 53, we find that. Verses 2 through 6, we find sure, certainly that living he loved me. We find in verses 7 through 8 that uh, he died for us. Dying he saved me. Verse 9, uh, he was buried. We see that there. And buried he carried my sins far away. Verses 10 and 11 uh, we find hints of the resurrection where rising uh, he justified us and we're going to march through this now I'm just giving you an overview these actual words aren't there it's describing these events and then verses 11 12 one day he's coming again so let's dig right in here to verse 2 Isaiah 53 now in verse 2 and it says in God's word Isaiah 53 and verse 2 and for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant this is uh, this is a beginning right and as a root out of dry ground you think of part dry ground and, and a fresh a fresh tender plant arising and he had has no form of comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty some translations point, point out or say this with comeliness and beauty there no attractiveness that we should desire him this is talking about uh, Jesus and we'll see as we read on in the passage that it is don't take my word for it but he came from heaven he was born of a virgin he lived a sinless life he was a common laborer to the age of 30 when then he began his three and a half year ministry that lasted till he died on the cross for you and me and so we believe in the life of Jesus, and uh, historically we can show uh, there, there's really no argument among those that study the issue that Jesus was a real person that existed in this world. And so one of the things I will share with you, though, is there's lots of artwork and pictures of Jesus. We don't know what he looked like, but we can't help but draw a bunch of pictures of him anyway. And so, you know, we, we do know that most of them are, are uh, probably not accurate. First of all, all the ones from the medieval times of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, that's just not correct. Uh, Jesus was born a Jew in, uh, in, in Israel. He would have been a little darker skin, probably black hair, dark brown eyes, that kind of thing. We also know that I realize nobody wants to draw a, a, a painting, paint a painting of, of Jesus for him to not look real, real nice and sharp and as fancy as they can. But notice it says there was no attractiveness about him. That doesn't mean he was a bad looking guy. It just meant he didn't stand out of the crowd. But most of the paintings and pictures we see today have a striking, eye-catching, stunningly good looking man. And so they might not be completely accurate, you see. That's all I'm saying from the text. And then it says here in verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Are you carrying grief or sorrow today? You actually don't have to because Jesus already has carried it. But then it says here, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, the people in his day, as they saw the suffering he began to go through, began to deem that he deserved it for some reason. Verse 5, but it wasn't for what he had done. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Transgressions of the law and iniquity is lawlessness, the Bible says. So the breaking of God's law or sin, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, meaning the punishment we deserved went to him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the sin or lawlessness, iniquity of us all. 
Now, there's a couple things we want to bring out here. One is it's personal. He bore our griefs, our sorrows. Our, he didn't just bear griefs and sorrows and transgressions and iniquities and punishment. No, he bore our griefs, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, our punishment. It was laid on him. And it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone our own way. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 3, uh, 23 and Romans 6, 23. All we like sheep have gone our own way. The sins and wrongs and evils and all the shame and everything that went with it was laid upon Christ at the cross. All the past, present, and future ones. He took it. And to make it worse, we are all like rebellious sheep going our own way. And all of that has been piled up on Him. You know, I think if there was a song that would represent mankind in His self-centeredness, and I don't mean this to cast slight on the person, but as I say the name, it's going to do it a little bit. I don't mean to. It's not the point. But you'll recognize it. I think if there was ever a song that represented mankind, it would be Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. Because that's what we do. We do it how? Our way. But it's time that we see what the Lord has done for us and that we allow Him to work in our hearts to do it how? His way. That's right. Absolutely. In fact, the song that we are, are using as an outline of our message today, here's the first verse. One day when heaven was filled with His praises. One day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt among men, my example is He. Word became flesh, and the light shined among us. His glory revealed. That's right. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. And buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day, he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Look with me in verse 7 here of Isaiah. I'd been reading Isaiah all week. I'd been singing the song all week. And I realized last night, they actually go through the same events in the same order. And I thought, this is just too neat not to actually overlay and show. It is really, really neat. I'm, I, you know, I, I doubt that the authors of the song were looking at Isaiah 53 when they, they wrote it and put it together. But it, it just goes together. Look at it, verse 7. And it says here, for, oh, wrong chapter, Verse 53, I'm in uh, chapter 53, verse 7. I'm over here in chapter 54. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the what? Slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. A lamb to the slaughter, that is a gruesome thing. I have experienced it. My dad uh, decided that as we were growing up that we needed to know where food came from and it, that it wasn't Walmart that the food that's at Walmart came from somewhere else. And so uh, he called up a fella and he bought a mutton. You know what a mutton is? A sheep. And he said, hey, uh, can we actually come be part of the process of getting that ready? My boys need an education. Yeah, not all education happens in the classroom. Praise the Lord for classroom education. We support it. We believe in it. We have Christian schools. We are thankful for them. My kids are in them. Absolutely. And then there's those extra life experiences that you'll never get in a classroom like um a mutton we went over there and they hung that sheep upside down by his back legs and then it, it cut its throat as its life drained out and then we did the whole, we did the got our hands dirty did the whole thing my dad said this is what food is you know the stuff we were eating at the time anyway and so i, I did some of the same kind of stuff with my kids we're pretty much vegetarian mostly vegetarian but uh, when Lauren wanted to eat chicken I'm like that's fine go down to Mississippi Papa's got some chickens you can tell him you want to kill one and eat it and Mama will fry it up for you you got to help clean it she got a horrible look I said those things don't come from Chick-fil-a that's not where chicken come from that's fine eat it but but see where it came from she's same thing with, I want to eat some fish okay well we floated the creek caught some fish scraped them up cleaned them up right there on the bank had her help got her hands bloody fried it up her and I sat there, we ate some fish. She, Dad, thank you very much for doing this. I want to be a vegetarian again. <laughs> Score. Yeah, that's great. Good stuff. It's not wrong to do that, but hey, healthy choices, right? That's what I want for, for them if we can uh, steer them in that direction. And so that's what we're trying to do. My dad was thinking of some of the same things as we got our hands dirty. But, but that sheep, as it hung there about to die, it struggled 
but it did so silently. Didn't say a word. Later on the farm, we would have sheep and goats, and we would have to doctor them. And, you know, they're not handled every day like with a shepherd. They're just out in the field in the net wire fence. And, and so they were more a little, little wild, if you will. And so we'd catch them, and they were kind of scared of us. And we're trying to do stuff to help them. And the goats, they would scream. It's like they're begging, please don't hurt me, please. Let me go. And they're just making all the horrible noise. But then the sheep, they would struggle, but they wouldn't say a word. Not a noise. And so it's interesting that Jesus, when the trial came, did he defend himself? Did he speak on his own behalf? Did he beg for his life? No, he did none of those things. It says, like a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And the, the beautiful thing about the passage that we're talking about right now, this is all written hundreds of years before Jesus came. This was a prophecy fulfilled in Christ, showing the uh, foreknowledge of God and the authenticity of Scripture. Now look with me in verse 8. We're talking about his death as a lamb to the slaughter. And then it says here in Isaiah 53, I closed my Bible so I've got to take a moment to get back there with you. It says in Isaiah 53 here and verse 8, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Now what does it mean there that he was cut off from the land of the living? Cut off from the land of the living. If you're no more in the land of the living, you are now dead. He would die. That's what it's talking about, okay? And it asks, who will declare his generation? Now, how is a generation declared? Well, some of the other translations and commentaries bring this out, but let me just illustrate. My generation is declared by my offspring. You have kids, that's the, that's, that's the evidence of your generation. You ever have a generation on planet Earth that doesn't produce offspring and everything's gone, right? And so, this is a prophecy he would not have kids. And of course, Jesus never married. The church would become his bride. Cut off from the land of the living for our sins. He was arrested. He was put through a rigged and mocking trial. And then they crucified him as he went willingly. And they nailed his hands and his feet to a cross. And then they stood it up. And, and here's how they do it. They would dig a hole. And you have the cross at the hole, but it's not in the hole because it's lying down. It's laying on the ground. That's how they would nail them on there, on the ground. Or tie them on in most cases. But in Jesus' case, they nailed him on. And then what do they do? They, they pick up the cross on the one end. The other end's at the hole, right? In the edge of the hole. And you stand it up. Slowly. And it begins to stand up. And then when it finally gets upright enough, boom! It goes down in the hole. And rips and tears and jars every bone in the body and as jesus hung there between heaven and earth redeeming mankind you and me through his shed blood my friends it was the most powerful display of other centered love ever to exist in the universe one day they led him up calvary's mountain one day they nailed him to die on a tree suffering anguish despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. And buried, He carried my sins far away. Right here in verse 9, here it is. And they made His grave with the wicked. His grave, there it is, His burial. When you're in a grave, you've been buried. They buried him, it says, they made his grave with the wicked. Remember, he died with uh, 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 two thieves, one on either side. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. The Bible tells us that he was laid in a, a tomb, a new tomb that had been hewn out of rock, where never man before was laid. It was the tomb of the rich man Joseph of Arimathea. He was buried among the wealthy. But death could not hold him. Rising, he justified freely forever. Let's see it here. We look here in verse 10. We see hints. We see hints of the resurrection and hints of the second coming. But they're definitely here. You know, even the disciples, being very familiar with the Old Testament, didn't see all of this coming. They didn't understand it. But looking back, that's when you can tell that prophecy was confirmed. I, I often warn people not to run too far ahead and think they understand future prophecy as much as sometimes they think they do. 
Jesus said, these things have I told you that when they come to pass, you might believe. Prophecy is clear that it has been fulfilled when you can look back and see it has happened. And so we look here in verse 10 and it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul a what for sin? Offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. There's a lot here in verse 10. One, it says here something that sounds so strange to some. And some commentaries and translations have tried to lessen it. But it says here that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's actually an accurate translation. How could it please God the Father to bruise him? To put him through what took place at the cross? Why? Because it was a plan that both Christ, the the pre-incarnate Christ as God in heaven, and God the Father, along with the Holy Spirit, had planned all along that He would take upon Himself the punishment, the transgression, the weight of sin and shame that come from mine and your sins, and that those would be placed upon Him at the cross. And so it says right there, it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. Jesus was going to die, but then He was going to come forth from the tomb victorious. And through that would be the avenue and the only way from which we could be saved out of this world of sin. Notice it says he shall see his seed. It just pointed earlier to him not having children because there's no one to declare his generation and yet now he has seed. And uh, if you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed. Offspring was called seed in the Bible. So how does he not have children and then have seed or offspring? Because we, redeemed through the blood of Jesus, are grafted in through the blood. We are the seed. We are the sons and daughters of God through Jesus. There it is. Wow. Now, he would see this, though. Now, dead people don't communicate and, 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 and deal with such things, so it's pointing forward to a resurrection. He would come forth from the tomb. He would see the seed. He would um, be satisfied, it says there, with the labor of his soul. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. He would come forth from the tomb to see that. That would be realized after the resurrection. You know, we see it looking back as it was all foretold, but it wasn't understood even by the disciples before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But Jesus would say such things as destroy this temple, talking about his body, and after three days I will raise it up. And they even thought he was talking about a temple in Jerusalem and all of this stuff. The song says, one day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered, now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. Living, he left me. Dying, he saved me. And buried, he carried my sins far away. You can just be thankful you didn't have to hear me bellering this on my tractor this week. But oh, I enjoyed it so much. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Here it is, we look at verse 11 again and 12, and we see that one day indeed He is coming, coming again for you and for me, for all those who have accepted His sacrifice where He died on the cross for us. And it says, He shall see the labor of His soul and be satisfied. Of course, that requires a resurrection, but that is not realized until the saints are gathered at the second coming of Christ when He sees all those that are redeemed through the sacrifice of what He has done. And then verse 12, a song of victory, if you will. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. This is a reference to a conquering king, and indeed he is when he returns, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, though he was sinless. He died for our sins, numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so he sees the labor of his soul and is satisfied. That certainly points to him coming again. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. 
That's right, living He loved me. Dying He saved me. And buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, O oh, glorious day. You want to be ready in that day being thankful that He lived a life loving us. That He saved us as He died on the cross. That being buried, just like baptism, a symbol of burying the sin and washing it away. And because of His death and His, His death and burial, that our sins can be buried in the depths of the sea. And rising, He justified us. Freely, forever. Not a gift we can earn. It's a free gift. And one day He's coming. Oh, glorious day. Are you thankful for that? Have you made Jesus the King of your heart, accepting these precious truths? into your life if not please do so as we pray right now loving father we thank you we thank you for jesus that he lived and loved us that he went to the cross he loved us so much and died to save us that our sins can be buried in the depths of the sea the symbolic uh, burial through the power of jesus and that then we can be resurrected to new life both to live now in a thankfulness of your forgiveness and look forward to a literal bodily resurrection when Jesus comes if we pass before then and that we can look forward to the place that the Lord has prepared for us in his kingdom as he comes in power and great glory to take us home 